Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to today's webinar from the Center for Healing Neurology. My name is Jillian Ehrlich. I'm a family nurse practitioner here. And today we're talking about using your gut to balance your immunity. Um, let's see, I have to figure out. Sorry, I'm a little bit new to using Zoom and doing webinars. So here we go. Nope. Oh, there we go. Okay. So um, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, please let me know or raise a hand if you cannot. A little bit about us here at the Center for Healing Neurology. We are a full service neurology clinic here in Seattle, Washington. We do also have a podcast for healing neurology, which you can find on iTunes and about eight other platforms. We do um, a lot of in procedure, or sorry, in clinic procedures, including um, Botox for migraines, stem cell therapy, um, autonomic nervous system testing. We also see patients both locally and remotely. So we see all kinds of chronic complex disease. We were founded by Dr. Eileen Ruhoy, who's a board certified neurologist with neuromuscular fellowship and mitochondrial medicine specialty training. She also has a PhD in environmental toxicology. And for to get to know me a little bit, your speaker today, um, I started studying Ayurvedic medicine in the late 90s, um, was certified in 2001, and went back to school interested in medicine from there. Did nursing for a long time at Harborview as a nurse, um, and then became a family nurse practitioner and learned about functional medicine at that time. And I've been certified in functional medicine since 2014. So that's really our background here, and that's really what we're bringing to the table. This is a great topic, the connection between the gut and the immune system. So I'm excited to talk about it. Today, what we'll talk about um, today, what we'll talk about basically is about the immune system, how we can think and look at the immune system. We'll talk about what the gut is and everything that it includes. We'll talk about the immune system specifically of the gut, how we impact this on a daily basis with mental, mental patterning, lifestyle, diet, and uh, food choices, and supplement and medications. And mainly, I'll talk about supplements today. There's just not enough time to kind of go through everything that can impact your gut and your immune system. They are huge systems. So our conclusion, and I'll come back to this at the end, is that we can really biohack the immune system by using the gut. So what this means is that when we want to focus on our immune system, because, and really this webinar was driven by um, the question that we're hearing a lot now about how do you stop cytokine storm, right? And so in this mix of COVID-19 pandemic, global pandemic, people are really concerned about their immune system. And what we don't think about is that we need an immune system that's strong enough to actually take out a virus, um, to be able to fend off attackers, but that isn't so elevated that we launch into cytokine storm in which the cytokines of the body, the parts of the immune system of the body actually burn up the host trying to get out the virus. I was going to say the parasite because, you know, the organism that lives in this, but it really is this, a virus in this case. So that's what we really want to talk about is how do we find balance? And because the gut and the uh, immune system have such a close relationship, they're so intimately tied, we can really use the gut to find that balance. So let's first of all talk about our immune system and how we understand our immune system. So our immune system is constantly doing four things, and these are listed here. The first one is to identify cells that are you, that are safe, healthy, and needed cells. The second thing um, is identifying cells that are marked as you, but that are not safe. So this might be damaged cells, cancer cells, old cells. And we take care of them with um, apoptosis, which means that you basically, uh, your cells get rid of them. They damage them, or they either phagocytize, which means eat, or they dismantle them, they lyse them. But our immune system is constantly surveying our system to find these old damaged or incorrectly made cells to get rid of them. So they're cells that are marked us. It's not, we used to think of the immune system as friend versus foe, but it's really, um, friendly us and not friendly us. And then the second part is the identifying the cells that are not you, that are safe and appropriate, which we need to be tolerant for. And this is all of the trillions of organisms um, that live in us. So the last number I saw was like 100 trillion. So every time I look up into the research, the number is growing and growing. And these are organisms that are not just in the gut. Most are, There's a lot in the gut, but they're also on our skin, in our ears, in our armpits, in our crotches. They're just everywhere, in our eyeballs, in our eyelashes. They're everywhere. So these are organisms that are certainly not us. So it's not just us or not us. These are cells that are not us that we do need on, that we do need. 
we crawled out of the cosmic ooze together and they belong with us. And then the fourth component that our immune system is always doing is identifying cells that are not us and not safe. And this is what we typically think of the immune system doing with something like COVID-19, where we are um, where we are trying to figure out who is not us and who is not safe that we actually need to get rid of. So this surveillance system is complicated and there's lots of different ways to look at it, but it's not just simple. It's not as simple as friend versus foe and it's not as simple as us versus not us. So this is what our immune system is doing. And the immune system is like a constant surveillance system. So we think about this really contained in this picture, you can see our lymph system. So we've got nodes or kind of hubs where immune cells will congregate and gather and hang out and wait and do their surveillance. And we find those in the head and neck, in the armpits, in the groin, in the abdomen, um, behind the knees. So these are all this, this lymph system that circulates kind of like a second, it's, um, not what blood goes through, but what lymph goes through, which clears all of those, uh, does a lot of that surveillance and clears those organisms if we don't want them there, those old cells. And then we've got a couple of organs which specifically function as hubs. So the spleen is a big one, the thymus gland, the gut, which we know houses 70% of our immune system, um, our bone marrow. And so there's these places in our body where the, surve the surveillance system kind of has their headquarters. And this is constant surveillance as you see this. This is like more than your ring doorbell is watching. Your whole system has millions and really trillions of cells that are floating around watching, evaluating, keeping you safe. And I know I put it in here like while you sleep, while you exercise, while you meditate, while you eat, especially because when you eat, you're really smearing um, a lot of organisms, right? So especially if it's fermented foods or probiotics, you want them to be live organisms, but it's a lot of stuff right along your gut lining and your body wants to make sure that whatever comes in is safe and healthy and happy. And so there's a lot of surveillance that happens. So we can think of it like this alert system picture here with like these cameras and this alert system, or we can really think of it um, as kind of like a loving mom who is really taking care of you all the time because this is not surveillance like um, big brother surveillance. This is like fierce mama bear surveillance. This system loves you and it wants to take really good care of you and wants to take really good care of itself. And the way that it does that is to be fiercely vigilant all, at all times to pay attention to what's going on. And just like a mama bear, sometimes it makes mistakes. Sometimes it, um, identifies an incorrect threat. And so those are some of the ways that we know that are, or sometimes it can't see what's going on because it's distracted somewhere else. And so this system really is looking at you all the time. And to really stress this, the cellular crosstalk is tremendous. So we really wanna be thinking about how many cells are doing this at every given moment of your life and even before and we will see a slide later where this really even starts in utero this this cellular crosstalk this immune activity we have cells in our body that do things and cells that communicate about them and the amount of connection between cells is phenomenal so the number of cell types the amount that they're communicating even as we're sitting here even as you're sitting here listening there's a tremendous amount of crosstalk if you really want to get nerdy with it, which is kind of my favorite thing to do, then you can check out Horst Ebelgeist's site, um, cells-talk.com. So here is a guy who has spent the last 20 years of his life trying to look up and kind of uh, and put together an encyclopedia of cellular communication. So you can see as of this spring 2020 edition, he's got 50, almost 51,000 entries. Um, and what he's really talking about, each entry is its own particular protein. And he talks in each entry about how it communicates with all the other proteins that he has found. So we need all this activity to function right. It's kind of a miracle that we're here. We need all this activity. And the total load, um, meaning that the perceived burden of threat, so how safe or how unsafe are we, and the type of threat both matter. So that's what we're going to dive into today. So, but just be thinking about how much cellular crosstalk is happening at every moment. When we think more specifically about the layers of the immune system, we can think of them as steps of protection. So our first, bar our first step is our barrier. So our skin, our mucous membranes, local protections. You know, I've got about, I was gardening this weekend, so I have like 50,000 cuts from things 
that hurt me. <laughs> and so you can see it's a little bit red around it. And so locally, there was a little bit of a localized response. My immune system went, oh, we got a thing over here and we're going to pay attention to it. And there's a, there's a series of things that happen. So this is that first layer is that skin. When that skin is broken, then the first thing that happens is we call, or the second thing that happens once the skin is broken, that barrier fails, is we call in our innate immunity. This is a fast system. It tends to be nonspecific and it alerts other systems if more help is needed. But really, you know, probably I'm not making a ton of antibodies or that's the adaptive system to this. This is probably just being taken care of with some localized inflammation that triggers cytokines and complement and other elements other cells will talk about. And then this is just going to fight off any infection, any dirt or any anything I got into that wound, and then it'll just heal. And that's kind of how things go. All that's needed is a localized response, probably from the innate immune system. I say immediate, um, intermediate alerts are these complement cytokines and natural killer cells, because they may or may not get activated. They uh, well, they will get activated to some degree, but they may or may not skyrocket. And this is the part where cytokine, you know, cytokines are communication cells, and so they can communicate cytokine storm. But you know, in that case, they're not going to. And it's only when a threat is that total burden is perceived as high, as well as um, the type of threat is perceived as high, then we can get that cytokine storm. But for the most part, these cytokines are doing all of this cellular communication and crosstalk. And then our next layer is this adaptive immunity. So this immunity, this level of the immune system is, um, uh, includes the B cells and the T cells, which then on their own also release complement and cytokines and natural killer cells. So it's a very circular, repetitive system. Um, but these B cells and T cells are antibody driven, which means, well, the B cells are antibody driven. <clears throat> and we'll talk a little bit more about these cells. But the adaptive immunity is a system that is, tends to be slower and it's more, much more specific. So these um, B cells and T cells will focus on one particular um, antigen or one particular trigger, and they help formulate our memory, our immunological memory. So you can see how pathogens in this little picture here filter down from the top, from the external environment. There can be lots of things that can set us off. And then innate immunity, skin, membranes, the pH of your gut is gonna break down a lot of the organisms um, or a lot of the threats that we imbibe through our mouth and swallow. And then macrophages, neutrophils, cytokines and chemokines, we're gonna filter down even more. And what gets down to that innate or adaptive immunity and the adaptive immunity at the bottom are really, there's a few specific things and that's how our immune system essentially takes care of them. And remember, oh, and then the last part is that our immune system really at some point, um, that response has to get turned off. So that can be T regulatory cells or IL-10 interleukin-10. So there are specific cells that essentially say, okay, we got this, everybody, you know, close the books on this one and go back to surveillance mode. And if they don't do that, that's also where we can have problems in our immune system. So remember there, there's this constant hum, waxing and, waxing, waxing and waning periods, local versus systemic. Um, we can have innate versus adaptive responses and then some returns to baseline. So that's really what our goal is with the immune system. And then we can look a little bit about these specific cells because they are so cool. They're so fascinating. And you can see from this, I like this picture. It's a pretty picture. So we can have this um, stem cell, this hematopoietic stem cell. So um, this original cell, which is undifferentiated. And, and then it's got these two things it goes towards, kind of the myeloid progenitor, which goes to make most of the immune, uh, the innate immune system. And then this lymphoid progenitor, which goes to make much of the adaptive immune system. And that's how things go. So which cells we see can give us clues as to what type or types of threat have been perceived. And this is part of why we often, and how severe the threat is perceived as. So people can feel like they have a fever. People can feel like they are sick or they have flu-like symptoms. But we can check a CBC, we can check different labs, and we can get a sense of like, well, what is your body telling you it sees? And that's part of what we do in a clinic visit. So how do we measure or evaluate these in clinic? We evaluate our innate immunity pretty easily with a CBC or a complete blood count. And this is something that gets done by everybody uh, in medicine. This is kind of one of the baseline labs, this hemogram. And you can see here, this is a, a copy of my hemogram from 2012. Um, so you can just see the white blood cell count is 5.2, which is perfectly healthy and normal. Red blood cells, hemoglobin and hematocrit, um, these top indices are not really necessarily part of the white blood system, uh, white blood cell system or the innate immunity. But if you drop down to the differential, suddenly we're looking at the different types of immune cells. 
New, I'm going to skip lymphocytes because those lymphocytes from that lymphoid progenitor are actually that adaptive system. But everything else in here is pretty much innate immunity. So neutrophils, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils, and they look at them by percentage so, um, as well as by number. So some other ways that we look at the innate immune system is with a CRP, C-reactive protein, with a ferritin, and with mast cells. Mast cells are similar to uh, basophils. And they hold their little packets of histamine, heparin, prostaglandin, and some other, about 200 other mediators. And they are really attached in tissue. So where a lot of these cells like neutrophils float around in the bloodstream, mast cells, which are like basophils, are attached to places of particular entry. So mast cells tend to live along mucous membranes and linings. So in your mouth, in your GI tract, um, on your skin, um, let's see where else, in your lungs, your respiratory, which is why we can have asthma and allergies can be set off by mast cells, which is why leukotriene inhibitors is a good asthma medication like monoleucast or Singular. Um, we also can have them in our vaginas and our, you know, our penis, wherever, you know, all the genitourinal uh, urinary tract, so in the urethra as well, which is part of why sometimes when people have chronic inflammation, they can actually have, um, interstitial cystitis or some pain with urination, it may actually be mast cells. So this intermediate, um, so we can check all that. This intermediate immu um, immune, part of the immune cell, we can check a natural killer cell level. It's just a lab core lab, anybody can order. We can check complement. So complement doesn't get checked very, these are don't get checked very commonly, but they sure can be. And cytokines are also, um, I've included this slide mainly because there's so many questions about cytokine storming right now. Sometimes when we do look at cytokines, we can get a sense of what direction and what burden people's bodies are seeing. So that's why this can be out, this why, this, that's why this can be relevant. And we do have some cytokine panels that we do. Here's an example of one here. And what I like about it is that really does show you how some cytokines can be pro-inflammatory, which means that they ramp up your immune response, and some are really anti-inflammatory. So they're really taking your immune uh, response down so that it doesn't go overboard. So lots of different things. And you can see here, these are broken down by Th1, Th17, Th2, T regulatory. So there's lots of different ways that we can look at these cytokines. When we measure T cells in clinic, um, this actually is not very common at all, um, but I just wanted to give you this one patient that um, ALPS, this immunodeficiency uh, uh, disease is very, very, very rare, um, but I just wanted to give you a sense of all the different ways that we can look at T cells, which I think is pretty remarkable. And again, these are LabCorp labs, so anybody who has a license that allows them to have a scope of practice to order labs can actually order these labs. People don't commonly order them, and if you ask your doctor, they may or may not know what to do with them, so they may, not, may or may not be willing to order them, but we certainly can look at lots of different types of T cells, and there's even some natural killer cells in here. When we look at B cells, we actually do measure B cells fairly regularly, although we don't call them typically B cells, but we look at different types of antibodies. This is very common, so little did you know you were checking B cells. So this may include an ANA, an anti-nuclear antibody, which we look at a lot for autoimmune disease. So here's an example of what an ANA uh, profile looks like. We also look at them in terms of total immunoglobulins to get a sense of what your underlying um, adaptive immunity in the B cell direction might look at, look like, might look like. So you can see this here, this immunoglobulins total in serum A, G, E, and M. And those are um, how we talk about antibodies. So we talk about IgG immunoglobulin, A's, E's. E's tend to be with um, anaphylaxis, allergy, or like when you're, you get stung by a bee or you eat a peanut and your throat closes up or you get big wheels on your skin, hives, um, that's often an IgE. IgA is along the gut lining because it's mucous membranes. So it's looking at a lot of food allergies can be IgA. IgG can be memory cells and those can be anywhere to lots of different things. And IgM is often an acute reaction to something. So for example, here I included Epstein-Barr virus interpretation table. So you can see there's three different types of um, antibodies that we look at. So this viral capsid antigen IgM is an acute marker, viral caps, capsid an, um, antigen IgG, and then 
um, the EBNA, the nuclear antigen, is for IgG. So you can see that sometimes we look at these for new or for old infection and we can get a little bit of a sense of a time course. We do currently offer, just as of last week, this is very new, is um, COVID-19 antibody tests. So that looks at four proteins in the COVID-19 viral structure and it looks at an IgM, an IgG, and an IgA for each of those proteins. So it's actually a test that looks at 12 different types of antibody or 12, 12 different um, antibody responses by the body to see if a person has a history of being exposed to COVID-19. So that's one of the things that's happening now. So here in summary, we look at B cells commonly for clues, for the presence of specific threats, for general status, for autoimmune disease, and also for cancers. And I didn't include this, but leukemias, lymphomas, we look at um, a lot of antibodies and, uh, and a lot of these markers. We look at innate immunity also. So CBC can really look at, um, the white blood cell count can look at leukemias also and lymphomas. So now let's transition over to the gut. So now that we have a sense that in our immune system, we've got innate immunity, kind of this intermediary uh, immunity and this um, adaptive immunity, and they happen with different specificity over different time courses, and that they're all over the body and that they're doing those four things, you and safe, you and no longer safe or never safe, uh, not you but safe and tolerant, not you and pathogenic or dangerous. So we know that this is what the guts do. I mean, this is what the immune system is doing. It's doing it all over the body. Now let's take a look at thinking about how do we think about the gut. So we think about the gut in terms of its anatomy because we think of it really, that's how you learn it in fourth grade, right? It's the food tube. It goes from mouth all the way down plus a few digestive organs in there. We think then the second layer of complexity is to consider the physiology. So this is all this, the squirting and churning, the juices that happen. Um, the cofactors, all of the organisms, um, everything else that kind of goes in the metabolic activity of the gut. Then we can think of the enteric nervous system, which is sometimes considered like a third nervous system. Uh, what I think is interesting is that between the gut and the brain, you know, it's a bi-directional highway, but if you aren't familiar with it yet, you should know that 90% of the traffic goes from the gut to the brain. It's not a lot at the top, the brain saying, do this, do that. It's a lot of the gut saying, hey, this is what we got. Hey, this is what's happening. Hey, this is what's happening over and over and over. So um, there's a lot of communication there through that enteric nervous system. And then we have that immune system in the gut, 70%, as I was saying before, housed in the gut. It's where we most closely meet our external world. If you can think of it, we're kind of built like a long, tall donut. So technically, although I don't recommend it, you can put a string in your mouth, swallow it, it'll come out at the other end. And essentially that's because in some ways this is almost like outside of our body, just like in the donut, you know, the part that is you, the, the cake part, the fancy sweet part, the tasty part is the part that's not the outside and not the donut hole, right? So even though there's lots of stuff inside our gut, which is the lumen, that's that space, um, it can technically be considered sort of like a lining, like our skin. It's almost like it's outside of our body. And because it's the most, it has the most intimate contact with the external world, we have a lot of cells and processes there to, to manage how we come into that, come into contact with that outside world. So how does your gut help determine the status and response of your immune system? So we're gonna discuss four things today. Number one is how we digest food into immune building blocks because without good nutrition, we can't make the immune system. We can't make any of those cells. The elimination of waste, so motility and toxin release because if the immune system is too distracted by junk, then it can't see real threats. Biofilms and microbiome inhabitation. So all those you know, trillions of organisms in our gut lining, we need them, we, we want them. Um, and they help govern and direct our immune response, inflammation or not. Or not. And then the immune system, uh, the immune cells, we'll talk a little bit about what the actual immune cells are that are in gut tissues and assess what's coming down the pike and how they respond. So let's break these down a little bit. When we talk about digestion of food into immune building cells, we start actually with appetite. And I think that's relevant because when you think about appetite, when you have appetite, when you prepare food and you smell it cooking, you have that initiation of enzyme release. And that's actually the first part of your digestion is the release of those preparatory enzymes. And that can be um, lipase and amylase, um, both in your mouth and from your pancreas into your small intestine. That can also be insulin release. That can also be hydrochloric acid in your stomach, which is gonna break down your proteins. The um, release of bile acid out of your gallbladder in order to break down um, fat. 
So all these components. And so that starts when we have appetite and when we smell food uh, being prepared. So when it comes down, then we go down, we chew it up, we break it down further. And then here I kind of walk through step by step what happens as food goes down through the food tube and becomes us. And what we don't think about, which I'll mention from the Ayurvedic perspective, Ayurveda is that traditional, um, Ayur the traditional medical system from India, is that we break down food. We think about food, you know, you are what you eat, right? So um, if you want to be, if you want to be made of good stuff, just eat good stuff. But Ayurveda and functional medicine say we're not what we eat, we are what we digest. So we want to make sure that what we digest, we digest well. So really food, the, pro the object of food is to make tissue, heat and energy, and then immunity, and then consciousness. So you really want to eat the food for the level of consciousness that you seek. And I will say, even in Ayurveda, sometimes if people are, um, there is sometimes reasons to have heavy food, because that can be very grounding. Sometimes people can be too anxious if food is too spacey, like chips or popcorn. So there's a lot of recommendations that we can dive down into in another, in another video about Ayurvedic nutrition recommendations. But suffice to say that if you're not digesting well, if you're not having the right squirting and churning, I think of it as a car wash, you know, it squirts juices, digestive juices, and then you have to churn up all that food. Even though in a car wash, you're not necessarily breaking down the car. I know that. Um, but that's kind of what it looks like to me. So when we think about digestion, we want to make sure that we're digesting food into these primary components. How do we assess digestion in the clinic? So there's a couple ways. Clinically, we look at um, the hair, the skin, the lips, the nails, all of these things, and the quality of the eyes, the quality of the thinking. We can also look, I included for your edification, the Bristol stool chart. I talk about that a lot with patients in clinics. So how are you digesting? Are you having constipation? Are you having looser stools? So what's the quality of your, of your elimination? And then in Ayurveda, we look a lot at the tongue. So here's a few things that you might see if you're not digesting very well is specifically looking at if you've got a scalloped edge to your tongue or if you've got a coating in the back. So that coating in conventional medicine is typically thought of as yeast overgrowth um, or fungal overgrowth, but fungal overgrowth really will be raw and kind of painful and may bleed a little bit or be incredibly thick. If you just have some coating in the back or coating throughout the tongue, then we think that you're not digesting very well and we call that ama. And that ama is essentially junk. So instead of going from food to heat and tissue to immunity to consciousness, it's going somewhere along the way, it's peeling off and becoming junk. And that junk can actually be a big problem for the cells. Um, instead, of, instead of being good, clean fuel, it's kind of like you're trying to start a fire with wet wood and it'll just smoke and not be very warm. And it's actually the root of autoimmune disease in Ayurveda. So when we look at lab work, we can also look at lab work to tell digestion. So here's an example of one type of nutritional testing that we do. And we can see um, this test does, looks at your blood and urine and then puts it through a whole um, algorithm to kick out this summary of functional markers. So what does it look like in this time you have a normal need for, a borderline elevated need for, or a high need for? Um, and so you can look at all these different nutrients because again, we're not what we eat, we are what we digest. When we think about elimin elimination of wastes, so if we don't eliminate all of our waste, then our immune system can get confused because it's distracted. So when you're at, um, you know, those four things that are happening, if you think of yourself going to the county fair and playing that game where the pegs pop up and you have to shoot the right ones and not shoot the wrong ones, you have to get the bad guy, but not the lady with the baby. That's kind of what's happening in your immune system all the time. And my guess is that if you've got a crying kid who's tugging on your shirt, or if you have somebody who's like, hey, 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 if you have too many distractions, you're not going to make good choices about who's the bad guy to shoot and who's the right lady with the baby to save. And those are just generalizations. But, um, you know, you, you basically, um, your immune system can get distracted and get overwhelmed and can't see clearly what's a threat and what's not a threat. So we want to make sure that motility keeps going um, and that our our wastes are eliminated so they don't get reuptake, reuptaken into our bodies and cause problems. So uh, the motility component is, you know, this peristalsis. Um, and how do we look at this in clinic? We can look a number of ways at this. So clinically, you can do a home colon transit time test. So you can eat uh, three quarters of a cup of red beets and then mark down the time, the exact time that you eat them and then mark down the time you first see pink and the time you last see pink. 
and it should be about 12 to 24 hours. That's our goal. Even in Western medicine now we say like, oh, it's okay to have a bowel movement every three days, but that's not the case in functional medicine or Ayurveda. And I'm going to believe um, the people who've been practicing medicine the longest, which is Ayurveda. So, um, and here's a picture here of this AMA that I was talking about. In Ayurveda, we call the result of poor digestion motility or elimination AMA. And some other symptoms, not only the tongue coating, but if you've got joint pain, a cloudy mind, puffy skin, autoimmune disease, all of this includes AMA. So we can look at motility and elimination also via imaging in Western medicine. So these are fairly, um, I wouldn't say necessarily invasive tests, but they're expensive. So you can either do SITS markers with these little circles that you swallow and then the capsules open up and you look at where they are over time, you take pictures. You can do barium swallow and then do a series of x-rays. You can do gastric emptying scans. So these are all different types of imaging studies that we can look to get an actual sense of how quickly things are moving through the gut lining. And we can look at um, toxicity in lab work um, by looking at oxidative stress markers. So these are markers that when your system is on overload, it's kind of like how overloaded is it? So these are just four examples of oxidative stress markers here, glutathione, lipid, peroxide, uh, lipid peroxides, 8-hydroxydiguanase um, looks at DNA oxidation, and then coenzyme Q CoQ10. So those are some markers that we can look at. And we can also look specifically at toxic elements. So heavy metals might be an example. We can look for glyphosate. We can look for a lot of different um, aspects of toxicity, but looking at, and we can do them as a provoked where you take some DMSA, like a chelating agent one time so that you can see what's pulled out of your deeper tissues, or we can look at them just as what's floating around in your bloodstream. So certainly we wanna be eliminating those if we wanna keep your immune system on track. So biofilms, this microbiome piece, we really are a we. I think I've already emphasized this quite a bit. Organisms in us outnumber the cells in our body. So when you think about who's the parasite on who, think about that. Our microbes break down our food. They help us absorb nutrients. They make and govern neurotransmitter production and usage. 85% um, of our serotonin is actually made in our gut. And they function as anti-inflammatory or inflammatory triggers. So two pictures here, one talking about how many and where. You know, when you look at how many are in, how many species, and this slide is actually a few years old already, so my guess is, is that we've found more. And when you look across the lifespan, our microbiome changes with age. So the organisms that we have in our gut as children, as infants and children, are different than when we're elders. And the other thing is that this microbiome is going to change depending on the types of foods that we're eating. So um, you could say we are, we, the, those, in, those who are living in us are what, who we are feeding. I don't know if that's a saying. I feel like that should be a saying. <laughs> so you can look at um, who, you, who are you feeding in your gut? So if you're feeding a lot of carbs and sugar, then you're going to have different organisms than if you were eating many more green vegetables or many, much more fiber. So remember that now we're lucky if we get 30 to 40 grams of fiber, but our ancestors, we evolved eating like 120 grams of fiber a day. So way more fiber. Things were a lot more woody. And that changed what our gut flora looked like in terms, to break that, in terms of breaking that fiber down. So how do we assess the microbiome? So here's just a few, a few options. So we can do stool testing to look at the lower gut. So here's a, what's called a GI map test, but we've got a lot of other types of tests. But you can see in this test, we look for pathogens. So we look for organisms that are specifically inflammatory. We look for opportunistic bacteria. So maybe these aren't necessarily bad in um, smaller numbers and we would expect them to be there, but maybe they're really in high numbers and we would call that a commensal dysbiosis. So um, it's kind of like, you know, you don't only, you know, a few dandelions in your garden here and there may not be a big deal, but if your entire garden is dandelions, then some, there's a problem. That's not the crop you were aiming for. Um, we can look at fungi and yeast. We can look at um, viruses. We can look at parasites and worms. Um, so there's lots of things that we can look at. Remember, this is really testing the lumen of the gut. So the tube, the space, not necessarily the biofilms, which develop along the sides of the intestinal lining. So different organisms might live there. And we can look at SIBO breath testing for what's happening in the organisms in the upper gut. So this is you drink some sweet stuff and then uh, it's lacto lactulose actually. Um, and then you do timed exhalations into tubes and we look at how much hydrogen or methane you've produced to figure out whether maybe you've got some small, um, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. If there's organisms that are supposed to do more fermenting in the colon that has mechanisms for that. And if they've somehow moved into the uh, 
upper gut into the small intestine, and maybe they're causing some uh, chronic bloating or some intol food intolerances. There's also H. pylori breath testing. That's been done in conventional medicine for a very long time. Um, so there's lots of options for that. And now we're looking at the immune tissues that are specific to the gut. So I think when people perhaps signed up for the webinar, they felt like this is what we were going to just be talking about. But these tissues, while they house 70 to 80 percent of the gut, uh, sorry, 70 to 80 percent of that immune system in the gut, they are part of this whole other system, right? So it's important to talk about them, gut-associated lymphoid tissues, and they actually are all the way down. So the tonsils and the adenoids, um, while there's ring is in the back of the throat and it's kind of like that first gateway. And then we've got pears patches in the intestine and lymphoid aggregates in the appendix and the large intestine. So all of these different cells are really those hubs for surveillance. Um, this is the core of the constant surveillance specifically for the locations of the gut. And in this picture here, we're gonna look at a number of pictures of, pictures, um, of gut linings for um, the next couple slides. So what I want you to get is that above the line that those turquoise, those little turquoise uh, circles are all parts of epithelial cells. And that's the gut lining, which is one cell thick. And above that essentially is the lumen of the gut. And below that is what's called your lamina propria or kind of that basement membrane. And so remember, keep in mind that essentially that purple area is outside your body, even though it's between, you know, it's past your mouth and down. And then that uh, peach color is what is technically inside your body. We have to uptake nutrients. We have to uptake water. We have to uptake lots of different minerals and vitamins, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't want to uptake stuff that's going to hurt us. And so our body has to be able to differentiate which is which. When we look further, the gallt development actually begins in utero before we are even born. So notice this is a time course. If you look around the bottom, um, along the bottom here, you can see that <clears throat> the lighter pink is before you're born. So that's in utero and you're already developing immune systems along your gut lining, payers patches, M cells, um, T, um, T cell regulatory, T cells, B cells, dendritic cells are presentation cells. Um, and then at the time of birth, we say mode of delivery because whether you're born C-section or whether you're born um, vaginally is a question I ask every new patient I see because I wanna know how did their initial seeding go? How did it go? If you come out through um, the vaginal canal, you pick up lactobacillus. If you then do breastfeeding, you get bifidobacterium. And if you don't, you may not get those organisms, which people can be just as healthy, although we have seen that there's an increase in ear infections for folks who aren't breastfed. Um, and we can see that as by the age of three, we say that the gut is similar to the adult type of gut complexity, but you can see that those cells um, build on, they all add on to each other, both in terms of what's there um, and in terms, of, in terms of the organisms that are there, in terms of the immune um, products that our body is making, and in terms of the depth of those crypts that's gonna hold more immune cells. So that's that GALT. And then I just want to make the point that it is a crazy soup in there. There is so much going on. So you can look here. Um, I kind of have listed all these things, but again, this line, the snake line is our intestinal lining. Above that is the lumen. Below that is the lamina propria, which is our bodies. But you can see, and um, these cytokines, this IL-10 is anti-inflammatory, this IL-12, this TNF, uh, tumor necrosis factor, mast cells, eosinophils, all of these cells are really trying to figure out what to do in there. Now, imagine that you've got some inflammatory components. So imagine for ease, let's take something that we know can be terribly infective, like Clostridium difficile. That is a classic organism that things can really, they can really go downhill. You can get a toxic megacolon. It's actually fatal for some folks every year. Um, so let's say that you get in your body some Clostridium, some Clostridia difficile, and it's causing terrible infection and you're going to have a real problem. What's happening is that those zonulin tight junctions between those epithelial cells are opening up. We've got infective agents coming through. Why do cells open up with infection? Because we want to be able to get all those immune factors in. But what happens is that, so like even if I was to hit my hand and I would get a swelling, that's because those tissues open up so that you can get... Um, immune cells in there to fight infection, to carry away metabolic waste, to carry away those damaged dead cells, and then increase that circulation. But if your gut gets opened up by an infection, then 
it's very typical because the gut is so has so many organisms and so much different stuff in there that you can cause you can cause an inflammation that can be really dangerous. Um, we know that that exists for something like Clostridia difficile, but it actually can exist for lots of other reasons as well that may or may not be um, uh, such big triggers. So you can have a chronic low level trigger that may go on and on um, and that may cause a chronic inflammation that we call increased intestinal permeability or leaky gut. So naturopaths talk about this a lot and we don't have a good way to measure leaky gut. Um, there's some that say that we can, and you know, there's debate about that um, to measure intestinal permeability. But the point is, is that all of these cells, if they're not intact and they're not healed, then there's things that can go places they're not supposed to go. And then our immune system says, hey, we don't recognize this because it hasn't been uptaken appropriately. So there's also some reliable patterns. And the question in here is how do we maintain the right balance? Knowing that threats are gonna come into our system, what can we do to maintain our gut with a healthy, nutritious, immune balanced, mood stable, with all of the environment, all the environmental flux that comes our way, right? So we can get back to a healthy baseline and that's what we wanna talk about. So let's go through some interventions. So the primary intervention, um, is really our daily life. And in medicine, we don't talk enough about our daily life because it really is what we eat, drink, sleep, think, um, and do with our bodies that determines a lot of what our health outcomes are on a daily basis. And secondarily, we can go through some special treatments and, and interventions when your groove gets off and you need to get back in your groove. So let's go through those. The first one that I always mention is mental patterning. The reason that I do this is because our mind has an incredible power to determine our physiology. So when we feel safe, we trigger that um, parasympathetic nervous system. So this is rest and digest. And our immune system can plan for long term. So it can go around repairing, doing cellular repair and regeneration, all of the maintenance functions. So think of your house is in um, it's the middle of summer or the middle of spring and it's beautiful and it's not too hot and it's not too cold and it's not too windy. This is the time that you want to paint the garage. This is the time you want to replace the windows. This is the way the time that you really want to batten down the hatches so that when things are tough, everything's sealed up. When we perceive a threat, then we go into that sympathetic flight, fight or freeze and the immune system focuses acutely. So we let go of all those maintenance functions um, in order to attend to this acute threat. So what do you think happens though when we live in a society that has a lot of social injustice, that we work really hard, that we're not attuned to circadian rhythms, so we don't go to sleep when the sun goes down, we don't get up in the morning when the sun comes up, we're exhausted, we're not enough, we, we're not enough with our families and the people we love. Think about how much time as a culture that we spend with either strangers or workmates, um, and God bless workmates, but you know, that we're away from our family and our friends. So all of these things that serve to support us, when we have time so much away from all of those helpful things, we go more typically into that sympathetic response. And when we go into that sympathetic response, we're not doing a lot of cellular regeneration or repair. So let's say you had some Clostridia difficile in your gut and your gut lining kind of pulled apart, but now you're not home enough and you can't rest and you're, you know, even if things are okay, you know, there may not be any acute stressor that you perceive anymore. We still quite can't get enough parasympathetic rest and um, digest, feed and breed sort of action to do that, uh, to do those repairs. So some resources for this um, are listed here, meditation, breath work, exercise, restorative sleep, DNRS um, or Gupta program. Those are some online options for retraining the amygdala so that you can let go of old patterns of distress, hypnotherapy, and then there are some supplements that can support when you have a challenging time because realistically, the weather isn't always going to be good. So you, we are built for recovery, we're built for resilience, and we're built for episodic stress. Like here comes one storm and now the storm has gone and we'll do all that repair. So if that storm is coming, you can really build your system up with things like ashwagandha, L-theanine, glycine for sleep. Um, and I include social justice here because there are ways that our bodies weather that are not our individual fault. And we live in a society which really emphasizes our individual power, which I think is true. But what we know, um, and there's, we did a podcast with Steven Bezruchka, there's another coming out very soon, all about how social and political factors really can determine a lot of our health. So there's a great book, um, The Spirit Level, and what it talks about is two British economists, which I thought would be very boring. But what they note is that when there's greater economic inequality, 
everybody has worse health outcomes. So everybody's lives get shorter when there's greater economic inequality. Rich people and poor people both die sooner. So it's really important to think that our mental patterning may be like our fault, but in a lot of cases is not. Um, so we can all work for all of that. So the next piece is the lifestyle of the GI tract. And so this is not just what food we eat, although I will talk about that, but this is the lifestyle around our eating. So you wanna customize a diet for you. What culturally are foods that are important to you and your family? Um, what, uh, what to eat? Oh yes, I'll talk about that next. Where do you eat? Ayurveda always recommends eating, sitting down and paying attention, not in your car, not in front of a screen, not while you're listening to this talk. So just put your food down and just let your body pay attention to the outside or pay attention to the inside. So sitting is really important while you eat. And then when do you eat? Be routine about what it's how you choose your patterns. If it's intermittent fasting, that's fine. If it's three squares a day, that's fine. But have some routine so that your body knows how to burn the fuel and it knows when it'll get more. And then think about why do you eat? Like, why do you specifically eat? Why do you individually eat? Is it because, is it for nutrition? Is it because you need more fuel or you're tired? Is it because you are feeling emotional? I definitely have emotional eating patterns. <laughs> I know that I'm not the only one. So you wanna think about why do you eat? And if you can, make it so that it's clear so that what you're doing is feeding your, your um, tissues, your heat and energy, your immunity and your consciousness. That's really what you want your food to do. And then think about how do we eat, the temperature of our food, the textures of our food, the rituals around eating. Eating can be so beautiful. This, boot, this bowl of food I've included here out of um, Sahara Rose's Eat, Feel, Fresh cookbook is fantastic. I mean, look at how delightful and beautiful that is. Our food should be beautiful. So here's a few resources for that. And then we will, you know, and we should, and we are now talking about what actually food, what food should you eat? So picking the right food. And it can be really summed up easily with Michael Pollan's food rules and eater's manual. And when he says eat food, meaning not processed junk, meaning not plastics, not disodium bicarbonate, you know, just not additives and things that you wouldn't recognize, but eat food, not too much and mostly plants. So there's some recommendations here to start with, avoiding processed foods with additives and dyes. Um, there's something called the fine gold diet, which really talks about specifically getting those out. Avoid foods that don't agree with you. So 90% of food reactions are caused by eight foods. So these are dairy, eggs, peanuts, wheat, soy, fish and shellfish, and tree nuts. Um, and avoid, but avoid anything that you know doesn't agree with you because your body may have formed an immune response based on that increased intestinal permeability or that leaky gut. And maybe you just have an immune response to something now. So if it bothers you, just don't eat it for three months and then try adding it back in. Enjoy seasonal, organic, lots of variety, lots of veggies. Juicing is a great way to get micronutrients in, especially across a potentially inflamed lining because your body doesn't have to do so much digestion and breakdown if the juicing has already broken it down. So rebootwithjoe.com has some recipes and we'll be coming out with some juicing for your neurology recipe soon. And then consider fermented foods. So these can be hard on a person with mast cell activation, but um, Julie O'Brien's Fresh and Fermented is a great way, or fire, she runs Firefly Kitchens, which is here local in Seattle, and it's great fermented foods. So this is just a start. Learning how to eat can be a lifelong love affair. And then let's talk about some supplements. So in terms of keeping it clean for motility and elimination, it's elemental to keep eliminating wastes. Um, this digests excess ama, and you can think about your symptoms, which symptoms of ama you might have if you have them. So joint pain, cloudy mind, puffy skin, um, fatigue, uh, that coating on the tongue. There's a spot below the knee on the inside of the knee that's a good marma point for um, ama which I'm sorry that I can't show you here, um, but we want to keep inflammations low, inflammation levels globally low, that keep that toxic, that global toxic burden low. So you want to make sure you're drinking enough water so that you actually have enough, you can actually move your bowels and eliminate urine. You want to move your bowels with magnesium and fiber. Um, fiber can come in, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, digestion of food, so trifla is a great supplement before bed. Um, adequate fire, so adequate fire to do that transformative digestion. Um, digestive bitters, like the same as cocktail bitters. A brand I like is called Urban Moonshine. It's just one that I've had good luck with over the years, but 
bitters are very specific. Um, people make them kind of like they do beers. Like if the sun is here and the moon is here and the crickets are chirping and it's August 6th, have this beer. It's kind of like have that bitter. So um, exploring bitters can be a really fun thing to do. Adding in fresh ginger is a great way to increase digestive fire and having healthy spices. So this is not like five-star fireman spice, but this can be cardamom, cinnamon, um, cumin, turmeric, all these kind of warming spices. And you want the right temperature of food. It's easier to digest warmer foods. So consider what appeals to you, what the season is and what your body is doing. If you have a lot of ama, then I would go for more easily digested foods so that your body only has to take the, the food from 40 to 60 miles an hour, not zero to 60. So warm wilted salads, like doing a pile of warm veggies on spinach and letting that spinach kind of wilt a little bit can be an easier way to digest fresh uh, greens, uncooked greens, raw greens. And you wanna do the right amount of food. So in Ayurveda, this is called an Anjali. An Anjali is what you hold in your hands. And after any meal, you want one third Anjali to be food, one third Anjali to be liquid from either soup or you know, drinking water or and one third anjali air so that you have enough space um, and enough fluid for the right mixing of the food to digest well so consider that how much you're eating some supplements for the microbiome so this is where we get into prebiotics and probiotics and you know lord knows there have been 50,000 um, webinars about how to choose the right prebiotics and probiotics and so i'm not going to go into that really in depth here besides just letting you know that um, this Dempster clinic, I don't actually know them, but I really like their slide. So we can get these from natural foods and we can get these from fermented foods. And prebiotics is the substrate to feed the right kind of organisms. And probiotics is the actual organisms themselves. One thing I'll mention about prebiotics is that if you, we wanna feed these organisms in the colon. And if you have something like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth where you've got bloating in your upper gut that where you, you either have bloating all day or you eat food and 30 minutes later you feel like you're six months pregnant, that might be that SIBO. And if you're having prebiotics that may really irritate your system because those organisms that are fermenting that are not in the right place in your body. So we've got more work to do before you can necessarily add on a lot of prebiotics. And then we talk about gut lining. How do we actually heal up? Besides all these other things of using our minds and eating the right foods and eating, having the right lifestyle around our food um, and making sure that our motility is working and that we're making the river move at the right speed and direction. Um, how do we heal up that lining and decrease inflammation? So there's lots of options and lots of directions for this. L-glutamine is what colon cells actually build their little bodies out of. And so doing L-glutamine um, comes as a powder. So that can be really helpful. You can use soothing agents if it's specific inflammation, like maybe you, if you just had Clostridia difficile and you know you've got inflammation or if you've got something that um, you know has irritated your gut or you've got a lot of um, acid reflux, you've got that feeling of fire or irritation, then soothing agents like slippery elm, marshmallow, and aloe vera. Um, Butyrate is also another really good one for soothing the lining. There's a lot of combination products out there that help with di both digestion and gut repair. So Biogest is one, GI Revive is another, and Terramend is another one by Thorne. Uh, GR GI Revive is designs for health and Biogest is also Thorne. Biogest is more for digestive um, components and the Terramend is more for the gut lining repair. Colostrum is what helps us put our first lining together when we're first born. So remember those first three days of mother's milk contains a lot of colostrum. If you're dairy intolerant, you probably won't be able to tolerate it. Um, and I just always feel badly for the colostrum that's taken away from whatever infant calf just was supposed to get that. Um, but colostrum is an option. And I've had a number of patients lately who have been using camel milk, a very anti-inflammatory milk, um, as a way to kind of also support gut lining. And then two of my newest favorite products, well, SBI Protect I've been using for quite a while. So serum bovine immunoglobulin G. Remember IgG is one of those, what is it? That's right, it's a type of B cell, it's an antibody. It's, type, it's one of the part of that immune system. And so this comes from a cow and um, taken orally, it can actually help repair gut lining. So it's an anti-inflammatory, it allows the gut lining to get put back together. It actually acts as a little bit of a healthy prebiotic that people with um, uh, SIBO can usually tolerate, so it doesn't cause a lot of bloating. Um, and it binds up 
kind of bad stuff from bad organisms. So some of the organisms in our gut can have an outside coating that can be really irritating to the gut called LPSs or lipopolysaccharides. And so um, SBI Protect has four different mechanisms and it's a supplement by orthomolecular products. And then here we often use peptides. So BPC-157 is an oral peptide that can actually help replace that gut lining and help that gut lining to heal. So in summary, we are biohacking. Um, we're using the body in intentional daily ways to impact um, what direction we want it to go. And the reason is that we wanna do biohacking rather than just increase the immune response like to fight COVID-19 or do, just do anti-inflammatory anti -inflammatory to you know, take down chances of a cytokine storm or treat autoimmune disease is that we really want a smart immune system. We really wanna boost its intelligence. Um, all of the practices we've discussed uh, work to remove unnecessary irritants so our gut can do its best work, which feeds the immune system in the right input so we can do its best work. So this is finding the sweet spot of response. How do we turn on the gut when we, I mean, turn on the immune system when we need it, and then we turn our, you know, and then we stop it when we're done needing it. So this is really trying to find balance in the immune system. And as we talk about um, the gut lining, and as we talk about all these ways to get started, um, with having the healthiest gut and having the healthiest immune system, we want to remember that there's a ton of pollution. There's a ton of pollution and injustice, and our food supply is often questionable at best, depending on where we're getting our food. How long is it, has it been irradiated to get rid of organisms? Has it traveled for thousands of miles? Has it been bruised? Has it given up its nutrients? Was it what kind of topsoil was it grown in? So all of these things are. Um, are reasons to try and join a community supported agriculture or a CSA farm so that you can get local organic and fresh vegetables um, and work on your mind so that your mind is doing its best work to help your gut um, and then work for social justice so that all of us can be liberated and have our best chances for health together. So I wanna thank you for listening today. You all hung in there for all that blah, blah, blah and all those complicated slides and those lipopolysaccharide discussions. Um, I hope that you've gotten some good information and I'm happy to, if I can, I can try taking some questions. Let me figure out if I can do that. Um, let's, I'll see if I can allow people to talk um, or you can write in questions, I think, but I'm not actually even sure how to look at that. Um, okay. So let me see if I can turn this on. Let's see, Q&A. Okay, so does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask at this time? And I think some of you should be able to talk. Oh wait, maybe you're all still muted. I can't unmute any of you. Well, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to type them in, which I don't see any. Um, so we will go ahead and close for today. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm excited to be continuing these conversations. Um, I'm excited to be continuing these conversations as we move forward here at the Center for Healing Neurology. And I go, I hope that you got something that's helpful in your life. Please feel free to contact us at reception at Center for Healing Neurology if you have questions or if you'd like to know more or with requests for future um, webinars because I'm having a good time putting these together. Thanks all, take care. Oh, wait, I got two questions. Do you have, sorry, do you have any recommendations or ways of freaking out if someone should lean towards a paleo diet with more meat or a more plant-based diet? So we have different feelings um, about that here at the Center for Healing Neurology, which is pretty fun. Um, from the Ayurvedic perspective, um, Meat is really to be used only if you're having trouble digesting other things. So, and um, here the neurologist, Dr. Ruhoy, is vegan and so says that there really isn't any reason to eat meat. Um, and I tend to use meat only if people are very sick and very weak. Uh, and very weak, uh, weak. So other than that, we tend to say a plant-based diet. One thing to know about plant-based diets is that plants with all their fiber can be harder to digest. So you need to amend them, like warm them up, roast them, spice them, help them uh, break down so that your body isn't taking them from zero to 60. Um, and Ashley says, thank you. Thank you, Ashley. All right, you guys, take care. Have a great day.